Just a quick introduction, Michaela uh, is with uh, is a patient representative at GLI Equilibristi HIBM in Italy, uh, where she is a rare disease advocate. And she's also a rare disease uh, advocate for the community in Europe. Uh, she has, she's actually a summer Yorodas uh, medical R&D and winter, uh, winter school scientific innovation and translation research fellow. So over to you, Matara. Thank you, Shubra. Okay, I'll try to share my screen in here. Uh, let me know if it works. All right. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Uh, big congratulations to you all at World Without Genie Myopathy. Great conference. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, so today, um, as uh, Shubra mentioned, I'm going to talk about the role uh, patients should have in decision making and research co-creation. So we will discuss together uh, the role uh, patients should have and I would like to, to make this session as interactive as possible with you. Uh, we will try to answer uh, a couple of questions together. So uh, I'm Michele Onali. As uh, Shubra mentioned, I work uh, as a rare disease engineer in myopathy patient representative at uh, the Equilibri Stage IBM which is a patient organization for gene, my, gene myopathy based in Italy. Uh, okay, so just a brief overview of uh, this presentation today. Uh, so we will try to answer together a couple of questions. Uh, I would like to um, answer with you uh, this question, what does it mean to be a patient advocate? We can answer together also why is research for rare diseases and especially ultra rare diseases like gene myopathy so complicated? I'm sure many of you are here um, to have such an answer and we will uh, talk more, more about this um, all together. Uh, then uh, another question that you may have today is uh, of course, uh, uh, if uh, we can, uh, which role can I should patients play in research and decision making. So if we are developing a medicines for patient, why shouldn't these medicines be developed with patients? And then uh, can patients and researchers achieve equal partnership in research co-creation along with all the other stakeholders? So researchers, clinicians, regulators, and so on. And then we will speak more about progeny. Um, so just uh, um, diving into the challenges of uh, rare disease, um, as you know, this may sound basic for you, we all know the challenges, but I wanted to expand a little bit on this to, um, to discuss more on the role and importance that uh, patient advocates have in research for rare diseases. So of course there, is, uh, there are less patients, less interest, less funding, we know that. So uh, research is quite challenged. There, are, there is scarcity of experts worldwide. There is less visibility, less people talking about the disease. But one point that we don't focus much attention on is the fact that worldwide we have less patient organizations and we have few dedicated advocates. So all these challenges actually are all interconnected and it gets even more complicated when we are speaking about ultra rare diseases. So they become interconnected and the challenges increase, as I said. Um, so we can't afford to wait for something to happen. And this is not just for gene myopathy, it's for all rare diseases. And the challenges increase when we have ultra rare disease. So patients have to become the drivers. So uh, just to give you a quick over overview on who we are and uh, how difficult it is uh, um, for us to even run an organization. Uh, the mission of course uh, is that of um, um, developing awareness on, uh, on the disease, strengthen collaboration, drive research. But these uh, are the challenges and also opportunities that we find uh, in Europe. Uh, so we are the only patient organization in Europe, but we would like to, um, to have an impact on Europe and not only Italy where we are based. As you know, uh, Europe is big and we have to face language barriers and also outreach. We have poor uh, fundraising capabilities, meaning we have to face the fact that we have uh, um, 
we have uh, economists that cannot afford uh, to um, to even fundraise and help. Uh, uh, I don't know what's happening uh, in here. It's not me, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, with this science. Um, so there are uh, in Europe, uh, we can uh, take advantage of opportunities for cross-border collaboration, uh, meaning um, we can work all to together towards open science. Uh, the selectivity of competitive funding is quite huge, and we have also an equal national funding available, so our efforts increase exponentially. Uh, the other uh, opportunity that's, that we find is that uh, in Europe, we indeed have a stronger rare disease community. So at the Equilibristi, uh, we uh, literally work in two people, patient advocates, working entirely on a voluntary basis. And uh, we cover just administrative expenses for, through membership fees and free donations. So it's quite, quite complicated. Uh, so uh, now I will give you a quick overview on uh, um, patient participation and how we can move forward from active to proactive patient involvement. Um, so just, uh, um, just a couple of, um, of information uh, about who I am and how I got to, to be um, a, di a diagnosed patient with GNA myopathy to uh, working on research. So I will tell you quickly um, what was my journey uh, from being a patient to uh, working in research co-creation. Um, so I was diagnosed, when I was diagnosed, there was scarcity of information. So it was not uh, like today for newly diagnosed patients. You can find more information in English uh, and it's much more uh, practical. Um, so only three weeks later after my diagnosis, I participated immediately in the natural history study at DNH. And uh, as Dr. Nalini was mentioned, it was my very first opportunity to understand uh, how much it was important for researchers to collect uh, data on the disease. Uh, so this happened in, in the US, which allowed, of course, interaction with researchers and have a better disease education. Uh, then uh, everything actually changed in 2018 in Europe. Uh, as you know, in that period, uh, the gene myopathy com uh, community was facing um, a little bit of, um, uh, you know, negative feelings because uh, uh, we couldn't achieve uh, um, efficacy with the ultragenic trial. And uh, I was motivated to learn more, uh, to understand how I could contribute. Uh, and uh, thanks to training opportunities in Europe, I could work uh, on uh, education in research and development. So how um, clinical trials are designed, what we need to understand uh, and look into to, uh, to show efficacy and, uh, and safety in, uh, in medicines. So um, this is very important because uh, from uh, patient participation, so uh, from being a simple uh, subject, so by uh, helping researchers with, uh, with samples, everything changed because uh, education and research and uh, development allow me to uh, be more involved and uh, eventually uh, become an equal partner in research and participate uh, in the European Gene Program on Rare Diseases, which is the call we participated in too. Uh, this, uh, uh, I wanted to show you the timeline because as I said, the fundraising is quite, quite complicated. It takes time. And it was very, very complicated uh, uh, in the sense time consuming because uh, as you can see, it takes, uh, it took one full year. And uh, when we apply for uh, public funding, uh, of course, uh, we need to um, encounter the possibilities that we may not be successful. And this was the case. There was a success rate of 9.6%. Uh, and you can understand how there are high possibilities to, to spend one full year on an application proposal and then not being successful. And then eventually we uh, kicked off the Progeny project in uh, June 2001. Um, so these are the priorities identified uh, by patient, uh, support academia, interaction between uh, basic and clinical scientists at early stage. We want uh, um, patients to be involved uh, in the process of uh, 
taking decisions and not afterwards. Uh, we bring experiential knowledge, uh, train patients in research and development, as I mentioned before. We want to avoid application of efforts and we, have, if we want to expand research to other countries because we need uh, research going on in more uh, countries worldwide for gene and myopathy. So the role of patients in this project, uh, we have a leading role in governance and project coordination. Uh, we voiced a concrete research plan uh, in the, since uh, the research idea and co-writing of the application. We identified the funding opportunity, as I mentioned, and uh, uh, along the three years of the project, we will uh, be uh, centrally involved to agree on the profile of the therapy. And of course, our role is that of being representative for the community. So we want to represent the patient diversity and the lived experience of all patients. I'm so sorry to interrupt, okay. but I've launched the poll. Can you guys see it? Uh, no, we cannot. In the chat box, no? Okay. No. No, no, sure. Okay, so uh, the scientific of the um, it's, uh, the project is aimed to develop uh, an, uh, an improved substrate replacement approach. Uh, so to improve uh, the gastrointestinal um, effects in encountered in previous clinical trials, and then uh, uh, working on identified biomarkers. So in here, I, maybe I can write the direct uh, link in the chat box, but uh, I wanted to direct you to a very good short guide on patient partnerships developed by Eurordis and the European, um, uh, the European Rare Disease and um, EJPRD. Uh, so it should, it's a short guide aimed at uh, developing patient partnership in uh, basic preclinical and translational and social research. So this is directed, of course, uh, at researchers and clinicians as well. Um, so in here, I wanted to show you uh, three concepts of uh, patient participation that you will find in the guide. And uh, as I mentioned, we start with patient participation. Uh, literally, patients contribute uh, to research as subjects themselves. So this is a, particip this is a passive participation because we literally uh, participate, as I said, by giving samples. The second stage is the one of patient engagement. So patients can indeed review research proposals and we can design or co-create materials. And we have in here an active um, role of the patient. And then eventually uh, the proactive role of patients is that of being involved, meaning that the patients become official partners and co-investigators like in Progeny. We identify patient needs, uh, we direct, uh, design, develop, uh, and co-write research proposals. And then we can also contribute to in the interpretation and findings of uh, results. So uh, if we want to be involved uh, as uh, patients, of course, uh, the patient stakeholder group uh, is made up of uh, different groups uh, uh, themselves. There are individual patients and carers who can share their personal experience uh, with the disease and can help indeed uh, researchers understand more about gene myopathy. So they share the personal experience. Uh, there are patient organization representatives who represent and express the views of a patient organization. There are patient advocates who support the community entirely of patients, so they don't bring in uh, just the personal experience with the disease, but they need to think about the all challenges that the entire community face, so there are not uh, differences in level of progression, everyone should be uh, represented equally. And then patient experts, experts uh, uh, with, um, with technical knowledge in research and development, which can uh, of course uh, help uh, during uh, the regulatory process of medicines development. And then uh, uh, most recently, there are uh, more uh, um, patient advis advisory boards being created, meaning uh, research institutions ask for patients to advise on priority setting, project design, and so on. So as you can see, patients indeed can have uh, an essential role in uh, research co-creation. 
So uh, patient partnership means uh, working with patients is not simply about having patients participate in research, is not just informing patients, is not just consulting patients, it's much more, it's not giving a seat without a real voice. So when we decide to work with patients, we need to consider that patient partnership should not be sporadic, it should be continuous. It shouldn't be a tick box without a concrete plan, and especially it shouldn't be a symbolic act of involvement. It means, uh, uh, in fact, working with patients with meaningful continuity. It means uh, include patients' perspective, needs, and priorities in the research plan. And it means uh, a shared leadership and decision-making, as I mentioned before. Okay, so this is exactly what we aim to create in ProGE, uh, having the patient always at the center and at the center of every um, decision-making process. Um, so, um, as I said, the project was initiated by uh, Liquilibristi HIBM, and we decided to include and make sure that this project was uh, as collaborative collaborative as possible by including uh, many, um, many countries, many different countries. So we have uh, Canada with the um, Children's uh, Hospital in Eastern Ontario with uh, Dr. Hans Lok Mueller. We have Cardiff University in the UK with, uh, um, with Dr. Pertuzzati. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, the Nova um, School of Science and Technology in Portugal with uh, um, Dr. Paula Videira. And then we have uh, Germany with Dr. Uh, Rudiger Oskurt. And then Italy with Pierluigi Caboni. So uh, we wanted to make sure the patient was always at the center. And we will aim to make sure this continue to happen in the next three years. So uh, in the audience, there are, of course, uh, uh, clinicians, as we, as we noticed, the researchers who may wonder, OK, so how can we reach successful and minimal, meaningful patient involvement? We definitely need to rethink the traditional science, definitely. We need to see patients as active partners and co-researchers. We need uh, to have uh, a genuine interest in uh, involving, involving patients. And we need to build and nurture the collaboration as early as possible. As I said before, decisions are taken. So, um, so to finish this presentation, who is a patient advocate then in the rare disease community? Well, it's definitely a, a versatile and multitasking um, person. It wears different, different hats. Um, it raises awareness about the disease. It drives research. It is... He's expert about the disease because he lives the disease every day. And definitely it brings uh, uh, knowledge about the disease. He represents uh, the uh, whole community, as I said, and not just the personal experience with the disease. So it's a big uh, responsibility. It can be a mediator, a, com a communicator. It can be a translator. We talked about language barriers. It translates language and science. It runs and manages an organization. So it becomes also an administrator. It wears really, really, really many hats. He's a continuous learner. The patient advocate is challenged to learn something new every day. He contributes to build and support and expand the network. It has many, many, many roles that sometimes can be quite overwhelming, but it's necessary for the community. So does every little bit count? Uh, my answer is yes, but commitment is essential to achieve results. And uh, in rare disease, uh, this is absolutely what we need in the world uh, community, especially for uh, gene myopathy. So this is a call for help, absolutely. And uh, I will finish this presentation by thanking uh, Eurordis and the rare disease community for allowing me to, to learn something new every day. It's very, very important to work uh, uh, within the, the gene myopathy, but also the rare disease community because we really can learn a lot from other rare disease. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to get in, in touch with us. In here, I put just uh, uh, the contact details and uh, uh, for um, um, ProGene, which is in English, as I said, we have 
problems in running the, um, the website in English. It requires a lot, a lot of effort. Um, so we tried uh, to use Twitter to make sure that all our um, information is uh, in, in English and accessible to all the patient community. Thank you, Michaela. Uh, I'd like to introduce the next uh, speaker, that is Mr. Ambrish Kaparia. Mr. Ambrish Kaparia is running a patient project with the a muscular dystrophy association in Mumbai. And they as a group have raised a lot of funding for the entire, uh, for the project. So Mr. Kaparia, over to you. Uh, it will really be good to hear from you and what you've done together with the entire patient group uh, and brought really all the groups together to uh, raise the kind of money and the awareness uh, and take the project forward. Over to you, Mr. Thank you. Kaparia. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction and I would also like to thank uh, Shilpa and Alokji and Sudaji for giving me this opportunity to speak on the GNE Myopathy platform. Now, uh, we are not from GNE Myopathy, we are the group for muscular dystrophies and uh, particularly we focus on Becker and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, now, a little bit about my past and to give my introduction. Uh, I'm not from a science background and neither hold any uh, uh, degree in science. I'm a commerce graduate and it was in 2007, it was in 2008 when my son was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy when he was just uh, uh, 18 months old. So uh, the things turned around from 2008 onwards, like... Uh, it's almost like 14 years now that we have been uh, looking forward to some treatments. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, certain medications are now available for the Duchenne muscular dystrophy kids uh, in uh, some in exon skipping and even some other repurposing drugs are coming forward uh, uh, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other, other uh, uh, Becker muscular dystrophy, which is a milder phenotype. Uh, in 2008, uh, Doctor, thanks to Dr. Khadilkar that he, Dr. Satish Khadilkar, he encouraged me to join the uh, Muscular Dystrophy Society, which is uh, run by him under his tutelage. And things started to change then onwards. Uh, it was a good uh, platform to me, which was offered by Dr. Khadilkar to come in touch with various uh, clinicians in India, in Mumbai especially. And then... Uh, also to come in contact with the different researchers and uh, uh, going through the different research papers, we figured out that muscular dystrophy, addition muscular dystrophy doesn't at that time have any kind of uh, treatment except the steroids. And uh, so we thought that it was no point like uh, going from you know one, one doctor to another doctor, one clinician to another and rather focus on the research. So uh, in 2000, uh, or around in 2009 or 10, I came across uh, other uh, patients and other parents who had already founded this uh, parent project, Muscular Dystrophy in India, and were looking for more uh, like-minded parents to join hands with them. So one of our founder uh, trustees is Mr. Chitin Bhutade, and uh, he was the one who was leading this uh, parent project muscular dystrophy and later on like we figured out that the research is the only way forward that you know we can help our children of course there were other medications available like uh, a lot of supplements and uh, of course steroids was the frontline treatment and later when we came together with many like-minded parents we took up the research projects in india uh, the first one being of uh, gene therapy, the, the, the recombinant uh, AV, uh, the stuffing gene therapy, which is uh, uh, which we collaborated with uh, Narayan Detrale and Dr. Arpa Ghosh is the uh, primary investigator in that. He's the researcher who is heading this research. He has his presentation coming up after me. So uh, thanks to Narayan Detrale for collaborating with us and joining hands with us for the research. So this was one very ambitious project that we funded intramurally. 
uh, we raised funds, we raised awareness about the disease uh, within our community and also gave presentations to various uh, uh, companies to raise funds through their uh, CSR activities. But ultimately we found that in India, uh, the research is not given more priority than the treatment. Uh, if you have a treatment, there are lots of donors who will come forward. But if you are targeting research, it's very difficult to convince people to uh, uh, donate for the research. And similarly, in within the community also, uh, there is a fear of donating for research because they think that the research may go, uh, there's always a risk of failure in research. So the research may fail and the money may, money may not be worth investing in the research. So with the help of few like-minded uh, patient families in Mumbai, around 10 families, we started funding this research uh, uh, for uh, uh, the AAB gene therapy in India. And I'm happy to sh share that the results also are ready with Dr. Artha and he will be announcing those results very soon with the patient community. The preclinical results, I mean, not the clinical results. Of course, the clinical trial hasn't yet started. Uh, it will all depend upon the results that uh, uh, has been found in the uh, in the MDX mice models, which are the models for this particular animal models for this particular disease. Uh, similarly, uh, of course, with COVID, we we are delayed. Otherwise, the research would have ended, and we would have been ready with the results uh, almost a year year ahead. I mean, year ago, but because of COVID. Uh, many reagents could not be arranged in time and uh, because of the frequent lockdowns, uh, these results have been delayed. Uh, similarly, we also started one more research. It's another vertical, uh, which is uh, 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 stem cells. It is a regenerative medicines uh, where we uh, have collaborated with a scientist in uh, Nizam Institute of Medical Science in Hyderabad. And he is... Uh, uh, keen to look into uh, adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells and umbilical cord-derived mesenchymal stem cells to see if there are any mesenchymal stem cells which can which are expressing PEX7 and PEX3, uh, the myogenic precursors. So if we find that there are robust uh, cells that are available of this kind, which are pre-myogenic cells expressing the myogenic markers, then uh, it will be a good achievement. It will, uh, it will be very encouraging to see if the MSCs have that potential. And uh, then let's see how we can take it forward from there uh, into clinics. The, the third research vertical that we have taken up is with the University of Kalyani in, uh, in Kolkata, where we have just inked the MOU in July this year, uh, where we are looking into uh, eutrophin upregulation mediated through CRISPR-Cas9. Now, eutrophin is an uh, analog of dystrophin, and this protein will be for every Duchenne child. I mean, it's very similar in its uh, uh, characteristics with the eutrophin. So there have been many research in the past that even the eutrophin upregulation can compensate for the loss of dystrophin. So it doesn't require any kind of uh, exon deletions or a specific mutation. Uh, here you can target all the, include all the, uh, all the boys who are suffering from DMD and bacomuscular dystrophy. So this is one another vertical that we have uh, just signed the MOU and funded this research in collaboration with University of Kalyani in Kolkata, where they will be looking into uh, repressor elements of the eutrophin because normally when the eutrophin is uh, generated, it also gets repressed by the repressors which are found in the eutrophin gene uh, in the three prime UTR and the five prime UTR. So we will be sequencing the eutrophin gene here uh, and look for any similarities between the human eutrophin gene sequences and the mice uh, gene sequence. And uh, this is again done in collaboration with uh, uh, University of Kalyani. And uh, the researcher over there is Dr. Utpal Basu, who is uh, working under the tutelage of Professor Purana in the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, those who are from Dushan community, they will know Dr. Purana. He doesn't need any introduction. He is uh, he's like uh, authority on eutrophin. So 
this research is also just begun in the University of Delhi. It's a three-year project, so we are still in a very infant stage. So the another project that we are running in India, in Mumbai, is with, uh, with a drug called uh, azithromycin. Now, this drug is basically to uh, cure or uh, to treat HIV patients. Now, the researcher at the University of Portsmouth in UK, in, in, in London, they have found that this can be repurposed in DMD because it can target and block the P2X7 receptors. The P2X7 receptor blocking will indirectly lead to a chain of uh, reaction that will block the interleukin 1, beta, and other immune modulators, which will reduce the inflammation and scarring of the muscles, which is one of the prime pathologies in the muscular dystrophy. So if we are able to run this research here, in we, are, we have already tied up for this research with uh, uh, Sir H.N. Hospital Reliance. And we were fortunate that Dr. Professor Derek Goreski, who, was, who did this research in the UK in the preclinical uh, studies in the mice models of Duchenne, uh, was here and he gave his presentation in January 2020. So this research is uh, was delayed because of again COVID and uh, preoccupation of all the clinical uh, clinicians who were involved as a principal investigators and co-principal investigators in this research due to uh, the COVID times. Now again, the scientific review committee of the Sir H N Reliance Hospital has reviewed this and they have given us certain suggestions to redraft the protocol, which is already going on, and soon. Uh, we will have a clinical trial registration for this particular drug as well. So these are some of the areas that uh, uh, our organization is currently focused upon, mainly on research. And of course, uh, as an advocacy group, we have uh, a lot of other patients who are interacting with, uh, uh, with the patients who are newly diagnosed as Duchenne. So they, we share our experiences with them and help them to, uh, you know, sort of uh, follow the standards of care which are already being approved by the uh, approved in the US FDA or even in India many of the drugs are now approved and uh, being prescribed for BMD.